Alrighty. Okay, so uh, we talked about uh, one form of impingement uh, last time. We talked about uh, osteophytic changes of the acromioclavicular joint and how the bone could impinge. We also now, if we're talking about the acromion, and we also talked about the shapes of the acromion. Uh, staying on the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, uh, this was an old scan from uh, probably the early 1990s. What we can see here is this is not so much an osteophyte, uh, this is callus formation due to degenerative disease at the acromioclavicular joint. And this, so you can't see real, really well on a plain film. Uh, but what you can see is it's depressing the distal aspect of the supraspinatus muscle in, in this location with the uh, uh, abducted shoulder. But if you notice here, there is increased signal intensity on this T1-weighted image within the proximal part of the tendon where, where it gets impinged by this callus formation and abduction and, and adduction. And so this is uh, AC joint impingement due to callus formation in this location. Uh, uh, other things that we can see in the acromioclavicular joint, uh, one thing that uh, uh, when you get degenerative disease, you can have large uh, cysts adjacent to the AC joint. And it's called the geyser sign. This is just an example of a huge cyst. They tend to go superiorly and present as large fluctuant uh, subcutaneous masses. So that's the geyser sign. Now, uh, here, here's, here are two fat-suppressed images. Uh, Yuri, what do you think of these two studies, or these two images? Um, so, um, look, looks like there's some, uh, there's minimal, uh, minimal to moderate AC uh, join uh, arth arthrosis. Um, and I think it is, de but it is depressing uh, uh, or abutting the supraspinatus myotendinous junction. Yeah, you know, it's a little hard to tell on the fat suppressed images because if there is fat here, it's going to be suppressed, so we're not really going to see it very well. This is very externally rotated, so we're actually seeing the uh, biceps tendon and the fluid in the bicipital groove uh, adjacent to it. So this is what it looks like on the coronal. Uh, this is a this is an arthrogram. This is a T1 fat set. This is the PD fat set of the same individual. And this is the, uh, the T2 non-fat suppressed image. And what you can actually see here is that there's an osteophyte, and there's actually pretty significant depression of the distal part of the muscle here, which is very hard to see on the fat suppressed images. So one of the reasons that I like to have non-fat suppressed images around the shoulder maybe not so important in the 20-year-old athlete, but most of the patients we see are older individuals, and we're usually evaluating degenerative joint disease or some manifestation thereof. That's still the vast majority of MRs we do at the shoulder are in older individuals, and you really need the fat contrast really to be able to adequately evaluate uh, a lot of the degenerative disease and the osteophytes uh, in this area. So this was actually, this patient had... Uh, uh, it was thought finally that their symptoms were really due to the impingement. They had a Mumford procedure and actually got significantly better. So uh, uh, another reason why I don't, I, I certainly, I think you always have to have fat suppressed images in any musculoskeletal examination, but I think you can overdo it. And you, re, you also need to have a lot of non-fat suppressed images because fat is a great contrast in the joint and uh, musculoskeletal system. Uh, in that case, the fat plane was relatively well preserved, but we're still considering that significant impingement just by virtue of the buckling of the underlying muscle. Yes. Yeah. No, it's 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 just like who you have in the in the spine. You can have very significant central stenosis of the spine and still have fat be behind the thecal sac. And uh, uh, the, the and in this particular case, you can see that there's significant depression of the supraspinatus muscle here, and this patient did well. Um, however, that's not where the pathology is. The pathology is um, distal to that area, where the rotator cuff uh, is in trouble. 
So uh, that's and that's caused by abducting, abducting the arm. So here's a, another individual. This was a, uh, at this particular time, about a 74-year-old who had been an avid handball player his whole life and developed uh, shoulder pain and was unable to play handball, which was a significant problem in his life. On the, on the uh, plane films, we can see an osteophyte inferior to here on the distal aspect of the clavicle. On the MR examination, and this was an old experimental coil that failed, uh, uh, poor signal to noise, but we can see a big osteophyte here depressing the supraspinatus tendon, where you can see that the muscle tendon goes down here at the musculotendinous junction, then back up again. So there is significant depression of the supraspinatus muscle and tendon. Here it is on the sagittal images. There you can see the osteophyte deforming the superior surface of the supraspinatus muscle and tendon. And there it is in the sagittal plane at the level of the maximum compression on this individual. He then went in and had a Mumford procedure. And here is the, this was an open Mumford procedure where they removed the distal clavicle here that relieved the impingement on the supraspinatus uh, muscle and tendon. And here we can see a nice tendon here and he was able to go back and play handball again after about three months and continued to play handball for about six or seven years beyond that. And then he got old. Now, what muscles would you want to rehabilitate in this patient? Was that you? I thought you didn't believe in rehab. Oh, no, no. I, I, I don't um, believe in going to physical therapy on a, on a regular basis. I believe in learning how to do exercises and then do them yourself. Well, I think you want to rehab his supraspinatus muscles to get rid of his supraspinatus muscles. Depressor muscles. And so that uh, when you abduct, you, you clear uh, that sharp area. It looks sharp, but it really isn't. It's very smooth. Uh, Which are the depressor muscles? Yeah. Well, Trapezius, maybe, and deltoid? No, I don't know. That's an abductor. I, I mentioned that before. I guess you forgot. Sean, are you out there? No, he's not. Well, you're a you're Latvian guy. Both. Uh, he's Latvian, Russian, Latvian. Latvian I'm, not, Russian. I'm not sure. Latvian, Russian? You're not sure? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Terrace minor, subscapularis, and infraspinatus. Don't ever forget that, okay? Okay. All right. Sit. Okay. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> After you've done that Mumford procedure, now aren't you like um, cutting through like the acromioclavicular, the, the, the ligaments of that joint? And you're losing the ligaments of that joint. So that's okay? Uh, uh, those are gone, uh, but uh, you st still have uh, the conoid and the trapezoid ligaments uh, that go to the uh, coracoid process. So the clavicle and coracoid are still stable in that regard. Is it a normal shoulder? By no means. So you don't want to wire that together then after you've taken it out? You don't well, want to... The only thing you can do is fuse it to, to the coracoid, but you don't want to do that. That's a real no-no. Because -no. actually you need motion at that joint space. So if you fuse it, it causes a great deal of debility. And basically the fact is you can't fuse it because the, you'll still have motion and you'll get a non-union is what typically happens. There are some surgical procedures that we might hear about where they can go in and put artificial discs in the AC joint, but that's more experimental. Uh, one of the Curlin Joe physicians has been doing that. Okay, uh, now another form of impingement that you can have in the shoulders after you have a fracture, and uh, a kind of a not too uncommon fracture is an avulsion fracture of the attachment of the supraspinatus tendon on the greater tuberosity. And if it the avulses and then heals in an abnormal position, like what happened with this individual, 
you can get a lot of bony deformity, which can lead to abnormal mechanics. In this particular case, you can actually see that the humeral head is depressed here due to this abnormal bone fusion of the, uh, of the fracture fragment, and that can lead to symptoms of impingement and abnormal function. Here's another example of old trauma, which led to an inferior osteophyte on the acromion, which is a little bit different than the others we've seen, and a large uh, greater tuberosity uh, osteophyte, and these impinged together, producing marked limitation of abduction of the shoulder. So the, there's some other weird things that we can look for. Now, the next form of impingement that I promised you would talk about is anterior impingement, or what's called coracoid impingement. And uh, this is typically seen in athletes who do a lot of cross-body motion with their shoulder, especially discus throwers and people with that kind of motion. Uh, uh, it typically occurs in individuals who have an abnormal configura configuration of the core cord process, where the core cord process is more in inferiorly placed and medially placed than normal. Uh, in one paper, what you can look for in the sagittal images of plane films, or, or I mean the, the lateral, if it's the right projection on the plane films, or the sagittal oblique sagittals on an MR examination, is a so-called chevron sign, whereas if you draw uh, lines between the tip of the coracoid process, the anterior superior margin of the coracoid process, draw a line going along the back of the acromion to the cortex, up to the top of the uh, glenoid, and then back again. And uh, if this is a prominence, like we see in number D here, where you get a, uh, something that looks like the Chevron sign for the Chevron gas stations, uh, then that uh, is thought by some people to be evidence that there's increased risk for core cord impingement. And basically what you're seeing is an abnormally laterally and inferiorly placed core cord tip. Uh, personally, I find that difficult to evaluate, but here's an example where you can see a nice triangle there and more of a chevron sign on the one on the right. What I find a better way to evaluate for this is really on the axial plane. And there are several studies that have looked at the interspace between the lesser tuberosity and the coracoid process. And a study that was done uh, at Curl and Job shows that if this is eight millimeters or less, then you have increased risk for symptoms of uh, anterior impingement. But I actually find that number is, uh, I don't think it's very reliable, just the number. And the reason we found is that there are a number of different reasons why that number can vary markedly, primarily positioning of individuals. And, and that distance can vary also a lot it tends to be small in people who have superior migration of the humeral head, especially with rotator cuff tears, and many of those patients don't have symptoms. So really what I prefer to look at is instead of that you can look at that inner space, basically people say that there's some risk for anterior impingement if it's less than a centimeter. This would be what the, more the normal would look like, where it's significantly larger than a centimeter. Uh, also, the normal uh, tip of the core cord is more superiorly placed than where you see the mid part of the humeral head or the mid part of the glenoid. So inferior placement is a, is a risk. But, and the, here's just some a study that, that we did a couple of years ago where we looked at this and measured it in quite a few individuals. And we found that there was a lot of variation uh, and it was critically important that the patients be imaged in neutral rotation in order to do this. Some people like to do internal rotation, but, uh, <clears throat> but it's very important that you standardize it. And this just shows that you get markedly different measurements based upon the degree, the internal or external rotation. Uh, and this is just what the difference varied between them. And what we found in actually this particular study, this just shows we, we, we sent patients to our center. Well, actually, we reviewed a large number of studies that were performed at our centers and at Curlin Job. And all of these people were supposed to be positioning the patient with external rotation, like we normally do for doing shoulders. But what we found is that there was marked variation in the actual degree of internal and external rotation.
despite the fact that the techs were trained to image the patient in external rotation. So if you're actually going to try to use numbers, what it means is you have to be extremely careful in positioning the patients. Or what we did is we actually, uh, I won't go through all the measurements, but we actually looked at the degree of angul angulation of the inner tuberous groove with respect to the uh, coronal line here. And you can actually correct for any degree of rotation if you know, if you have a norm for how that number is supposed to change based upon rotation. And here's basically what we found is in external rotation, we had the largest space between the two. It was minimal in neutral rotation and actually was slightly larger in internal rotation. So we recommend doing it in a neutral rotation and the average is right around 12 millimeters uh, in the group that we looked at. And it varies uh, differently. Now, what we found is this is one individual who was a control individual. This happened to be me. This is my left side and this is my right side. And it turned out in my right shoulder that actually uh, in internal rotation at 90 degrees, I actually had less than three millimeters separation between the lesser tuberosity and the coracoid process. The reason for that is on my right side, I have a rotator cuff tear, and there is a little bit of superior migration of the humeral head, whereas on the left side, I do not have a rotator cuff tear. So uh, it means that there, whenever you try to look at numbers to try to make a diagnosis, or the old saying is if you see a radiologist with a ruler, you're seeing somebody in trouble. Uh, the, the Just the straight measurements, numerical measurements, I think are fraught with a lot of potential difficulties, as we see here. So that's basically what we found, is that you have to be very careful if you're going to use measurements. Here we can just see that there's subscapularis tear, and there is decreased space between the core. We can see that there's a very markedly decreased space between the coracoid process and the lesser tuberosity. And in large part, that's probably in part because there's a big partial tear of the subscapularis tendon. That's only five millimeters in that individual. And then this patient has a lot of other pathology in the shoulder. And this is a patient who had symptomatic core cord impingement. But, but this is really what I want to get to. What I like to look for now for core cord impingement is not numbers, but I like to look, see if there's a physiologic change that might correlate with abnormal biomechanics. And in this particular case, I like to make the measurement. And if it's a centimeter or less that I'm concerned, but I really like to see marrow edema and the adjacent lesser tuberosity. Now you can have marrow edema here due to partial tears of the subscapularis, but if you don't have a partial tear, uh, which is generally the case, then what, what we find is you get impaction of the coracoid process against the lesser tuberosity, and this marrow edema in this location I think is probably the most reliable sign that we have right now on MR uh, for detecting anterior impingement. And here's just an example. We have a narrowed space here, and you can see the edema and the lesser tuberosity right where you would expect it if the patient had core cord impingement. But you could have erosions there as well, correct? Does it have nothing to do with the impingement? You have to look and see. Uh, that's, you, you certainly can have erosions, and if you have an erosion in that location, it's usually associated with partial tears of the subscapularis. So you have to evaluate it in totality. So if you have a large tear of the subscamp or a partial tear of the subscamp, then you may be dealing with something else. But if you don't have a large tear of the subscamp and you have a narrowed space, the edema pattern here, I think, suggests, actually, the edema pattern here suggests that you may have symptoms there, period. And it could be due to impingement, if everything else is correct. could be due to a partial tear or a complete tear of the subscapularis, or it could be due to a combination of both. Uh, so... Okay. One thing to remember also is the fact that the anatomy here varies. The coracoid process, the chromion, the clavicle, they all vary a great deal. It's a tremendous difference in, in, in uh, how these things appear um, from birth and uh, genetic reasons and whatever. And trauma is another, of course, the, the thing that uh, precipitates the symptoms. Now. Um, um, when it comes to pain, what happens to the humerus when a patient is having pain in the shoulder joint? 
explosions? No, what happens is the patient splints the shoulder and the head uh, migrates superiorly towards the chromial process. So when you put somebody in a scanner and they're in pain, they're going to be guarding against movement. And so if they're relaxed, they may go down. If they're in pain, they'll go up. And this is why you want to uh, strengthen your depressor muscles when you're dealing with patients so that they'll depress and circumduct. In other words, you can tighten these muscles down below and then be able to abduct the arm. The deltoid and the supraspinatus are very strong muscles. The others are usually are weaker because they're not functioning most of the time. Actually, the real answer is that pain isn't humorous at all. Pain isn't humorous at all. No. <laughs> okay. So uh, next, let's go to internal impingement, uh, often called posterior impingement. Uh, it's often seen with a thing called GERD. So let's talk about this. Now, what we're talking about now is only seen in high-level athletes. This isn't something that uh, uh, most of us are going are gonna to have. It's seen only in high-performance throwing athletes, and we'll explain why that's the case in a minute. It's due to extreme forces on the humeral head in the late cocking and early acceleration phase of the throwing mechanism. And we'll go through the different phases of throwing later, but this is when you cock back in the extreme uh, uh, external rotation. And it causes impaction of the posterior superior part of the humeral head against the, the posterior superior part of the glenoid. And you get impingement on the rotator cuff, and uh, you get impingement on the posterior superior labrum. So they are usually abnormal. So if we look at the different stages, this comes from uh, Job uh, and this article in 1992. You start with the wind-up, then when you get separation between the hands, then you go up to the early cocking, then you get to the late cocking phase, and this is the phase where you, you get the impingement of the shoulder. This is also the phase where, where we also get a lot of pathology in the elbow and throwers that we'll spend a lot of time talking about. Then there's the acceleration phase, uh, the, the release, and then the follow-through. Nope. Damn, Red Sox hit it over the fence again on us. But we can go through and see uh, some of this. Let me... Yeah, let me see if I can go back. And let's see if we can go through... Oops. No. isn't working properly. Or, I mean, the operator isn't operating it properly. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So now we can, we can see this is the early phase, then there's the hand separation. And then here's the early cocking. And then you go to the late cocking. And th there you can see at that particular point uh, is where you get the impingement both in the shoulder and at that particular point, we'll talk a lot about the stresses on the elbow that lead to elbow pain. Now, it turns out, uh, everybody in this room try to get in that position. It turns out none of us, unless you, you are a high-level thrower, can get in that position. And John, your goodest was talking a, a couple of lectures ago about the fact to be a high-level baseball pitcher, you have to have different anatomy in your shoulder. And it turns out that this anatomy changes typically between ages of about 12 and 13. And therefore, all, virtually all Major League Baseball pitchers were big-time throwers at, starting at 10 years of age or younger because it's in the early teens that they actually have changes in the body anatomy, and I, we'll talk a little bit about that, I think, in a minute here, uh, which allows them to get in this position. And what this position allows, allows you to do is that you then, if we, if we go a little bit more forward here, then we go through the acceleration phase. And notice in just one frame, we went from fully cocked to the release of the ball. So there's tremendous acceleration in the throwing through that, that aspect right there. That's about the release point. That's probably, I don't know if we can see the ball here, but anyway. So 
in order to be able to throw a major league baseball fastball, you have to have a large uh, rotation angle between the cocking phase and the release phase so that you can put a lot of momentum on the ball. So if you can't cock your arm way back there, you don't have the distance before you release the ball in order to be able to put enough momentum on the ball to be able to, to be a successful pitcher. And therefore, the anatomy of the shoulder has to change in order to be a Major League Baseball pitcher. They can't do this with the other arm because it's only the one side, the pitching side, where these anatomic changes occur because it's the pitching in the early teens that actually causes the, the, the changes in the bony anatomy and some soft tissue anatomy uh, to allow this to occur. Guy's wrist while I'm just throwing. Look at his wrist. wrist yeah. I'm not sure we're going to see the wrist very well here. Let's we'll see here. So there's the ball. From the start. From the start. Oh, go back. Okay, let's go back here. Okay, there we go. So he's got the wrist fully cocked at this point. Further back, okay. Here, John, watch. Yeah. Okay, watch, watch his wrist uh, from the get go. Just go back. A little more. A little more. A little more. Now watch how his elbow is up here, and watch his wrist as he goes forward. It's like this. It goes like that. And that's how you injure your ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve and also your own, uh, your um, uh, extensor, extensor carpi ulnar. Okay. Now, we'll, we'll talk later. This is actually a very good technique. This elbow up going back into the cocking phase is actually an important thing that all these pitchers are trained. Uh, because th that is part of the proper mechanism which decreases risk of injury. But we we'll have a talk about uh, the, the proper mechanics of the throwing with, when our, with our Curl and Job lecture. So we'll wait to, and hear that from Dr. Lippus Vasti. Just a quick question. What other athletes have this kind of motion? Who else other than pitch pitchers? Well, it's, it's big in Major League Baseball pitchers. It's also... Uh, and catchers. Catchers are basically like pitchers because of the, the throws that they have to make to second base. And then you can see something similar to this, but it's a little bit different in, in quarterbacks, in football quarterbacks. But uh, the rest of the position players of baseball tend not to get the kind of uh, impingement injuries that the pitchers and the catchers get. When he lifts that leg up so high, do they also have um, associated hip injuries? Yes, I'll show you some of that. The, the, uh, in fact, didn't I think I showed one of the, you maybe weren't here. There was a pitcher who has severe degenerative disease of his hip, and that's common in pitchers because, as you can imagine, they put a lot of load and they have a lot of weight as well as rotation at the same time. So... Uh, degenerative disease of the hip is common in, in pitchers. It's, it tends to be common in third baseman also. Uh, the, it, we'll get into the discussion of femoral acetabular impingement when we get to the hip. And that is a, a controversial area. And what we'll, we'll talk about those later. But yeah, there, there are a number of uh, injuries. Nothing that this guy is doing is normal. Okay. So, so then basically what happens is that in order to be able to be a pitcher, you have to shift your, the normal arc of rotation of the, L, of the shoulder about 10 degrees posteriorly. And that extra 10 degrees in the arc before you release the ball is critically important to being able to be a successful pitcher. And this just kind of is a diagram from, from uh, Orr that shows how the normal arc of rotation would be here and a pitcher it's going to be there. The total arc stays roughly the same, 
it just gets shifted back so that they're able to have that extra space in order to be able to put momentum on the ball. And this just shows us, shows how the changes occur uh, over time at different ages. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk, we'll, or I'll get more into that in his, his talk uh, with, with Curl and Job. Uh, this has been a big controversy uh, over the years. Uh, this cha Now, one of the things which occurs with this, let me go back for a minute, is that uh, these pitchers then tend not to have normal internal rotation. And, that's, and they can get pain on internal rotation, and that's called GERD, uh, glenoid internal rotation deficit is what GERD stands for. for. And uh, there's been a lot of argument as to whether that is due to these bony changes that we're talking about or soft tissue changes or both. And the big uh, argument here was between uh, uh, Job and Morgan, East Coast, and Job is West Coast here, uh, and uh, Job felt that, uh, uh, that, that a lot of the changes in the anterior shoulder pain that people got was due to stretching of the anterior capsule. Uh, uh, Morgan felt that it was due to, or I mean contracture of the uh, anterior capsule. Uh, Morgan felt that it was due to contracture of the posterior capsule, which didn't allow you to move forward. Now it's generally felt that this is primarily due to remodeling of the bone. Uh, with the osseous changes where you have both humeral and glenoid retroversion and therefore it's really primarily a bony change which allows you to have the more posterior arc of, of rotation. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of pitchers will have significant pain after their, their pitching and it hurts to go into internal rotation. Uh, and that, which is really the GERD syndrome, syndrome, is now believed to primarily due to muscle soreness from pitching. And it tends to be maximum right after pitching and tends to get much better after about three days, which is the reason that the normal rotation is about every four days. Uh, there have been surgical treatments for that in the past. A, a lot of things have been done. There have been... Uh, uh, tightening up, there, there, there have been a whole lot, there have been uh, laser tightening of the anterior capsule. Morgan went in and would release the, the posterior capsule. Uh, now, typically, the way it's treated is that after the, the pitcher is pitched, they'll go in and do stretching exercises to try to, general stretching exercises to try to regain internal rotation uh, and, and allow rest. Uh, because it's really felt to be a stretching overuse uh, strain of the muscles and uh, uh, and is with the stretching exercises uh, that are done now, there seems to be a much better outcome than, than in the past. So they go th so all the pitchers go through a, a series of stretching exercises after every game. So the the main motion during the actual motion is a exaggerated external rotation, correct? That they're doing, but yes. where they become sore is that you would think it would they'd feel relief by like coming being internally rotated after the game. Really, it's it's soreness. Now, well, let me ask you this: uh, of all the muscles around the shoulder, which muscles are have been associated with the with the speed of a fastball? Anybody? Subscapularis? No? Okay. Pectoralis, the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi. And what happens then is that they, you get soreness after pitching with those. And I think it's, uh, it's now believed that it's primarily just muscle soreness. And whenever, it, just like if you go out and on overrun, when you come back, you get very tight and you, do, you don't want to stretch. You don't have the same mo, uh, uh, range of motion of the muscles. If you try to touch your toes, it's, it's much more difficult. What happens when you have injury to the muscle, like overuse injuries, kind of micro tears of the muscle fibers, is it becomes more painful to stretch the muscles. So any area where you would be stretching muscles becomes more painful. So, you know, what some people will do, and this is controversial now in running, is they'll do gentle stretches after running. It's generally the, 
the big stretching before you run is now considered a no-no because it actually decreases performance. So now what a lot of people do after running is do gentle stretches, uh, not large stretches, and that's basically now what the baseball players will do is gentle stretches afterwards. G gentle, G-E-N-T-L-E. Walk before you run, and uh, after you walk, you stretch, and then you run. Uh, that's how you do it. And then after you run, then you stretch. And, uh, heat before, a nice after. All right, and then just uh, we can get through these. So, so GERD is internal uh, glenoid internal rotation deficit. Uh, and uh, we just talked about all these things. Uh, this is an interesting, a uh, couple of years ago when I was at a course up in San Francisco, the, the, the morning before I gave one of my lectures, I just happened to read the San Francisco paper and was looking at the sports section. And here was a, an article about the sad art of Major League Baseball now, because this is a graph of the number of complete games that a pitcher has thrown versus the year. And it peaked in the 1971, where there were 546 games where a pitcher completed the entire game. And then it fell, it's fallen substantially from them to only 48 games in 2007. And this he was talking about, this just shows that the uh, Major League Baseball has gone to the dogs, basically. But, but the reason this has occurred is we much better understand the amount of stresses and strains on the body that pitching occurs. And the owners of teams also realize that these players are very expensive. And the longevity of a player is very closely associated with the number of pitches they, they throw. And, and it's actually, it's very age dependent. If you throw a lot of pitches when you're younger, before age 20, uh, your your longevity in, in baseball is much shorter. Throwing a lot after age 20 does not have the same statistical significance. And it turns out that some of the great pitchers that we know about over the years, the, one of the reasons they became great pitchers is because they were wild in their early days, and therefore they didn't get a lot of pitching in until they became about age 20. And then they were able to settle down and and have much longer careers where they're able to produce a lot of the numbers they have. And there's a lot of, like in all of baseball now, there's a lot of statistics on that. And, then, and basically then in order to both increase the chance of winning the game and uh, uh, prolonging the, the lifespan of these very expensive players so that the owners get their, their, their money's worth, the, the number of complete games and the number of total pitches has decreased steadily uh, since the 1970s. And if we had another graph here of the longevity of a pitcher in Major League Baseball, it would go, be going in the opposite direction, where pitchers have much longer careers now than they used to in the past. That's about when sports medicine started to become a, a, a subspecialty and a more scientific than it used to be. And uh, of course, I went into practice in practice 1970, and obviously that's why uh, the pitching, <laughs> pitching went down. You're good at strikes again. That's known as post hoc ergo propter hoc. We're talking about full nine inning games, right? Like 546 games a season were played where pitches went for full nine innings. Yes. Yep. I mean, that's still not a lot of like the thousands of games that are like played in a season, right? So that's still, it was even then, it was a rare event for a pitcher to play nine innings. Yes. Not at all. Well, you they, can... they used to get quarters loan shots uh, and continued pitching. Right? Quarters see, loan shots, pitch. You see, it was 11 times more common then than it is now. Before you're 10, stop, and then start again. Uh, I think, I, I, I haven't done the study of this, uh, but I think to be a pitcher, you have to be a looser when you're, when you're growing up. A looser. There are stiffers and losers. 
and all depends on the collagen and, and the elastic fibers and so on in your, uh, in your system. So hypermobile versus a stiff person that's not mobile at all. And I call them losers and stiffers and, and everything in between. So, but, but what happens in the picture is they start out as losers, but they become stiffers because of arthritis later. And they all have degenerative arthritis in their elbows and shoulders. Okay, so what do we look for in an MR examination for posterior impingement? Uh, the characteristic findings are fraying of the undersurface of the posterior supraspinatus and intraspinatus tendons, cystic changes in the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity because that's where the bones bang together, and posterior superior labral tears are the characteristic findings. Uh, again, as I said earlier, the one time that we do like that I do like to do uh, ABR views is in the young uh, overhead athletes, and it's primarily to look for this one condition. So here's an example of uh, of a young of a baseball pitcher who's in the ABR position. We can see an impaction injury here, the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. This is in the same location, but it's a different mechanism. Same location where you get hill sacs impactions. It's the same locations where you get an erosion at the insertion of the infraspinatus tendon that we see all this all the time. The third cause for a defect in the bone in that location is posterior impingement. The real difference is you'll only see posterior impingement in the high-level athletes. So this is the impaction from chronic repetitive uh, 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 cocking of the of the shoulder. We can see fraying. There we go, bony impaction. There's the fraying of the cuff. See here, this is really the overlap area where the infraspinatus and supraspinatus fibers overlap together and insert. And we can see the fraying of the cuff in that location. And in this particular case, there's a loose body that's generally, that's pretty rare. Usually we don't see loose bodies. And here's a case, here's a 14-year-old baseball catcher with two months history of pain. Well, we can see, let's see if I have it here. We can see a little, this is a young person, so we can see this is a little bit of early impaction injury of the humeral head. Uh, and then we can also see that there is a posterior superior labral tear uh, in this individual. Uh, you, if you follow this up, this, this is not a uh, superior recess that goes into the superior uh, part of the, the straight superior part of the labrum. This is just in the posterior superior area, and that's an early cuff tear, uh, excuse me, early labral tear uh, due to the impaction of this part of the glenoid against this part of the humerus in the late cocking phase of throwing. So that was, a, and here's just coronal images. This is the same uh, young uh, baseball pitcher, and we can see the changes within the rotator cuff here. Uh, this is really near the intersection posteriorly of the supraspinatus and part of the infraspinatus, and we can see the fraying of the inferior part of the cuff there where it gets caught up in, in this mechanism, right in that location. Very uh, well, it's it's due to chronic repetitive injury. This would be severe tendinosis, right? But it's in a very focal location. It's not in the typical location we see in other causes of tendinosis. Which is more commonly anterior. Yes, which is more commonly anterior than in the mid portion. Here's another teenage baseball pitcher. We can see a little marrow edema here at the impaction side on the uh, posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. Here's a posterior superior labral tear. Just like we were talking about, this is a little bit more severe example. And there you can see the labral tear, the tear going all the way through. And this is an abnormal morphology of the posterior labrum due to the chronic repetitive trauma of the posterior superior labrum. This is really much more of a normal anterior labrum. So we can see there have been a lot of reactive changes due to the repetitive trauma from posterior impingement. A little bit older person, this is a major league baseball player, and we can see a little defect here from the chronic impingement. Here's that uh, labral tear, the posterior superior labrum in a characteristic location. Uh, here's another example of a major league baseball pitcher. There's the impaction injury. And then here we can see that uh, instead of there actually being a tear, we can see hypertrophy of the labrum due to years of, of chronic uh, injury uh, to the posterior superior labrum. Little tear there in the Abra view. Uh, 
now and this is now we're getting progressively more severe internal impingement here we can see a lot more edema within the bones breakdown of the cortex here you can see a really a partial tear of the inferior surface of the supraspinatus tendon and actually this is the infraspinatus tendon coming down here <clears throat> and the greater tuberosity posterior impingement and this can lead to tears in uh, individuals uh, which we'll talk about later <clears throat> Uh, you can get paralabral cysts associated. This is a little older individual, and we can see the trauma to the posterior splenoid here, posterior labral tear, and then fluid is going through the labral tear, and here's a paralabral cyst going into the spinal glenoid notch. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, here you look for some characteristic findings. Primarily, you look for the uh, infraspinatus muscle, because one of the things that can occur in Major League Baseball players, you'll see some examples in a minute, is uh, either from strain or from this, this cyst compressing the, the uh, nerve supply, you can get signal changes within the infraspinatus muscle and can lead to severe atrophy of the infraspinatus muscle. And for some reason uh, in these uh, Major League Baseball pitchers, it's... Uh, common to see atrophy of the infraspinatus, but I haven't seen much atrophy of the supraspinatus. And uh, maybe it's because these are just, these cysts tend to be primarily low down here in the spinal glenoid notch, not in the suprascapular notch. So it's getting the nerve distal to where it takes off for the supraspinatus. And here's just an example of the uh, signal change that we see due to the compression of the nerve innervating the infraspinatus muscle. Here's just a, another example, a much bigger paralabral cyst due to the posterior superior labral tear. And here we can again see muscle changes due to the denervation atrophy from the, from the paralabral cyst. And here we can see atrophy of the uh, infraspinatus muscle. And there's the cyst, there's the muscle atrophy. And here's just a, a, another uh, uh, baseball player. And here we can see the chronic impaction injury of the posterior aspect of the glenoid. So you can actually see bony injury uh, as well here, rather, not just labral injury. And here's a bony injury in this location. Now, this is a uh, Major League Baseball pitcher who was really one of the mainstays as the, in the uh, reliever for the Angels for a number of years. Here we can see the typical erosive changes from the impaction of the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. In this particular case, we can see a massive posterior labral tear. This is on 10807, posterior labral tear. Now, if you get a tear of the posterior superior part of the labrum, it's probably from the uh, posterior impingement. Uh, however, it's also common to see what are considered massive uh, labral tears. And if you see massive posterior labral tears, that's, uh, and you divide, you can divide the labrum into quarters. And if it's more than one quarter that's involved, then it's considered massive. Uh, these tend not to be due to the mechanism of throwing. Uh, anybody want to guess at what the mechanism is here, these massive posterior labral tears? Well, it, it's uh, these tend not to have posterior dislocation, but that's certainly a good idea. Well, actually, it is, I guess, a form of that. Uh, these are typically seen in weightlifters, and they're injuries from bench pressing. Uh, if, you, if you talk with anyone, and, and you'll hear about this from the physical therapist uh, when we get into the conferences with Curl and Job, when you bench press, the elbow should never go below the humeral head. So the farthest down you should go when you bench press is having the humerus parallel to the floor. That's a mainstay. But if you do that, you can't bench press as much weight. So what do they, they like to do? They like to go down and kind of bounce off uh, the posterior labrum, and then they get a push off, and they can they can uh, they can do more weight than if they just come down and kind of deadlift from that position. When you do that, you put tremendous forces, especially if it's a lot of weight, on this posterior labrum. So most, and certainly my experience in the patient population I deal with, the vast majority of massive posterior labral tears are seen due to weightlifting. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, in Major League Baseball pitchers, what they need to develop 
are the latissimus dorsi and the uh, and the pectoralis major because that's what they need to throw the fastball. So they do a lot of weightlifting. It's an important part of their their procedure. Uh, and this person just didn't do it properly. Led to a large posterior labral tear. Here we can see evidence of internal impingement. Bust is massively displaced posterior labral tear. And in this individual, as we were talking about, we can see that there's, notice how, how hypertrophied the supraspinatus and teres minor muscles are. The uh, subscap is large. All the other muscles are large, but notice how puny the infraspinatus is. And that's because with this mechanism, he probably had a compression of the nerve to it earlier. Uh, we don't see evidence of the cyst at this particular time. But again, that's something you have to look for in these high-level pictures. So chronic infraspinatus atrophy. Uh, he then had surgery in the off-season. We can see this, the suture anchors here. Uh, he came back to play, and uh, right before the season started, after going through preseason, he developed uh, pain in the shoulder again, and we can see he tore off uh, the, the labral retear, uh, the, the, the posterior labrum again. Just from capsular revulsion, as you're going back, the capsule's pulling on that in posterior labrum. No, it's a humeral head under load is shearing off the posterior labrum. Just like with an anterior dislocation, you shear off the anterior inferior labrum. If you uh, do bench presses inappropriately, you'll go back under a heavy load. The uh, humeral head will shear off the posterior labrum. Don't you think it's past the normal uh, range of motion uh, that they're trying to go through? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's when you, you, you allow the elbows to drop below the humeral heads in the, in the process. Right. If I'm not mistaken, though, uh, epilepsy causes most posterior dislocation. So um, that's where you're going to see it. So you're not going to see that many weightlifters. Uh, most weightlifters, when they lift that excessive amount of weight, they have somebody standing there uh, helping. Yeah, it, it, I don't think they get posterior dislocations. What they get is by putting this pressure of the humeral head against the labrum, they get posterior labral tears. Well, but, but, but I don't. Load and that's a subluxation. Yeah, it's a subluxation, but I don't think they actually get dislocations like a uh, like you get with uh, epilepsy. But you can. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Are these like um, single events that lead to the um, humeral defect and the labral tear, or is it the repetitive? For the labral tear, this is repetitive. It's generally not a single event. It's repetitive injury over time. Okay. Well, why don't we stop here for today? And tomorrow, or yeah, not tomorrow, Monday, we'll take up uh, the rotator cuff. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Y'all fed up with impingement? <laughs> yeah. It's all because of our foolish activities, <laughs> mostly for money. Fame and fortune. Yeah. Interesting.